to see everybody today. Today we're lucky to have Dr. Trevor Reif joining us. So Dr. Reif is perhaps best known as the genius behind Fieldbook, but he got his start in the field making crosses and selections in his dad's canola breeding program. So uh, he's, of course, a, a breeder like many of you and, and us in the past. So he has a PhD from Kansas State where he worked with wheat genetics and phenotyping. After staying a few years at K-State to further develop the PhenoApps platform, he's now an assistant professor at Clemson University. His research focuses on developing and validating new tools for phenotyping and phenomics research for diverse breeding programs with a primary interest in crop agnostic approaches and technology. So today we're excited to hear more about where he is today with PhenoApps and the opportunities for cultivating digital data collection tools that promote the growth of modern breeding programs. So uh, we'd like to welcome you, Dr. Reif, and thanks for, for joining today. We'll let you take it away. If anybody has questions, please put those in the chat, kind of like we've been doing in the past, and we'll answer those at the end. Thanks, Amanda. And I really want to thank you for inviting me to uh, to kick off the seminar series. Um, and especially calling in from Nevada with little ones running around is going to <laughs> going to always add an extra wrinkle into everything. Uh, so yeah, I am Trevor Reif. I uh, am an assistant professor at Clemson. Um, the the goal for my title obviously was to see how many puns I could fit into a a title about plant breeding apps. Um, there's this another one there somewhere of uh, breeders outstanding in their field, but I I decided to to leave it at two. And so kind of to, to shape, to describe my program and, and describe where I'm at, um, I'm in the coastal plains area of South Carolina. I'm actually off of main campus from Clemson. Uh, I have a, a small but growing team of a, a mix of develop, developers and geneticists. Uh, we have Cheney, Courtney, Mason McNair, and Brian Ellerbrock at the bottom. And uh, Mason and I are, are located at the PD Research and Education Center out in Florence. And so together, my team and I really focus on developing tools to improve plant breeding and can't talk about plant breeding without talking about uh, genetic gain. And so when we think about genetic gain, you know, we have the, the four different variables that we kind of have to keep, kind of have to keep in our head. Uh, the selection intensity, uh, our selection accuracy, the genetic variance that we can actually select with, and then how long we're taking for each one of our cycles. And the, the focus that I really want to pull in today is going to, to be on the selection intensity and accuracy. Uh, and then so developing the capacity to screen the larger populations, uh, both more accurately and more effectively. Uh, and so really this, but all of these different variables play into the, the plant breeding program as a whole. And so if my there we go. Uh, and so when we think about plant breeding as an actual process, it's a, um, we can really distill it down to three discrete steps. Uh, the selecting our parents, intermating those parents to generate novel allelic combinations, and then evaluating those combinations over a lot of time and a lot of space to um, determine our, our, to feed back into this cycle. And so th these three discrete steps really frame uh, all of the success that we've had in breeding and in crop development over the last 10,000 years. Um, but the one thing that they have really grown into over the last 100 years is the development of data from each of these individual steps. And so data collection has uh, has been very vital uh, to, to plant breeding and to crop improvement. Um, this is a slide that I pulled from a really old talk that I gave a long time ago. Um, but you can see that uh, even, even in the 70s, you know, data collection was important. <laughs> but when I started my PhD, I thought that things would be, you know, a little more advanced. Um, but it hadn't really changed in the 50 years that had, uh, or 43 years that had um, led, yeah, that it occurred between, between uh, when Borlaug was outscoring wheat and uh, pathologists at K-State were doing the same. Um, and so I, I kind of took a holistic view of this, um, this system and kind of identified where we could make improvements. And um, by the time I left K-State, uh, finished my degree, 
both the, the wheat breeding program there and the, the wheat pathology USDA programs had moved to this digital uh, data capture solution, which really begs the question, why should they, why should we go digital? Why should any breeding program take a digital approach? Um, and there's four really important points. Um, breeding is dependent on the number of entries. The success of a breeding program is dependent on the number of entries that they can look at in a, a given unit time. Uh, and so digital data capture allows for increased speed. Um, but at the same time, we need to be able to do that speed or to, to maintain that speed while maintaining data integrity. Mistakes in their breeding program are expensive. Uh, if you get to the end of get to the point of releasing something and realize you can't track the pedigree back to what you thought that it was, um, there that's a problem, especially if you're dealing with um, uh, an outcrossing species or, or uh, where the the uh, there are opportunities for mixing between different programs. Um, and at the same time, uh, we need a flexible approach. So once those paper field books were printed off, they were essentially immutable. Um, and I, I feel like everyone has probably seen some of the field books from these these older breeding programs that have notes written in the margins and uh, different scales used um, just to pick on the wheat breeder at, at K State a little more. Uh, his his uh, scale for a good plant was included stars and pluses and a few other symbols that had to be parsed out by uh, by his technicians. And so um, that's maybe a little too flexible in that regard. But um, so digital approaches also provide the rigidity necessary to um, to be able to use that data down the line. Uh, and, th and then finally, uh, accountability. Um, with digital data capture, we can know who actually collected the data. Uh, we can capture the metadata, like the person, when it was collected, the time, um, and all, even location and things like that. And so all of these different factors really play into uh, identifying these different data areas where uh, the breeding program really needs or breeding programs really need um, digital data solutions. And so my my research program has looked at developing many of these tools, um, these mobile applications to sort of satisfy these data needs. And for the sake of time today, I'm really just going to focus on one, which is Fieldbook. Uh, and can't talk about field book without going back in time just a little bit at this point. And so starting from the left, this is my, my PhD advisor, Jesse Poland, uh, and then his PhD advisor, Rebecca Nelson. Um, and in 2008, they met with Clement Kamau, who is the, the third person from the left. Uh, he's a sorghum breeder in Kenya. And CK was running two seasons of sorghum per year. But the main season, uh, it took several weeks to complete harvest and then months on top of that to digitally transcribe the data. And so they had a full-time tech whose job, whose only job <laughs> was entering the data. And so uh, the worst part of all of this is that they had to plant the next cycle uh, before they had the data ready to make selections from the previous cycle. So they would plant everything and then go out and chop out unselected lines. Um, and so then the, the idea, you know, taking uh, how can we increase the speed at um, at this data turnaround to make it, you know, a few days rather than a few months. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be awarded a project by the McKnight Foundation that uh, bought into and yeah, they bought into this idea, provided us a small amount of funding to develop a digital data collection tools primarily targeted toward these East African programs that we then released more broadly. Um, and of course, the outcome from this project was Fieldbook. And so this is the, the main interface, interface that breeders interact with when they use the app. Um, I just wanna spend a little time breaking it down into its constitutive parts just to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, so just starting up at the top of the screen, we have the information bars or the info bars that display information about the current plot or current plant or tree or, or whatever else that we're, we're currently looking at. 
these can be customized to show any data that was imported with the field file. Um, and here you can see that I've set these to plot ID, seed name, and pedigree. Below the info bars are small green arrows that allow navigation between the active traits. In this case, we're collecting height. Um, and you can see under height, we have some details about that trait that I've also set uh, to specify that this is going to be in centimeters. Next, we have the large black arrows to move between different entries. So as we move forward or backward through the field, the row and plot will update. And so if we press the right arrow here, it'd take me to plot two and then plot three and, and on and on. Um, if I was to hold it, it would scroll continuously through the entire field as well. Finally, at the bottom of the screen, um, we have the area for data input. And so since this is the primary area that breeders interact with, we wanted to make this as large as possible. Uh, the bottom of the screen are also some buttons to, to interface with the data as well. Um, so we have the ability to scan a barcode to input data, uh, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Um, mark the, the data field as uh, not available or delete the specific data point. Um, but of course, like this is a, a numeric keypad and uh, not all the data that you'll collect in any given program is numeric. And so this, this area actually dynamically changes based on the, oh, excuse me, the type of trait that's being collected. Uh, and so here's a, a non-exhaustive list of the field book trait formats. Each format is really our attempt to optimize the way that data is collected um, with a few different safeguards built in to ensure that the correct values are captured. Uh, so functionally, uh, a breeder would take these different formats um, apply them to the different traits they're collecting. Um, and so just to, to go through these a little bit, uh, we have our, our numeric trait, which we saw categorical, where we can define different categories, uh, percent trait for, for traits like lodging, our date trait for traits like flowering or heading, uh, our counter trait just to, to increase or decrease in, in single value intervals, uh, our text trait, if we really want just the keyboard to type in, a multi-categorical trait with a uh, sample data of Mendelian P traits there, uh, and then our, our Boolean true-false, um, our photo trait, which tags the individual photos with the name of the plot, and so those can be really easily analyzed later on, and then a, a location trait, uh, which captures the current location of the user. There's a few others, but I've, I've left it here. Um, so within the app itself, these traits can be managed and maintained. Um, breeders can create new traits as they need. Uh, they can combine these different formats with the, the different traits that they actually want to collect. And these can be reordered and hidden from the main screen um, as needed. And so kind of combining this, this whole everything that I've talked about up, up till now into a single slide, uh, we end up with uh, this dynamic area at the bottom uh, that shifts depending on the type of trait that we're collecting. So here we have the number of plants, we have the, the percent lodging, uh, the flowering, and the, the color of uh, whatever we're capturing the color of. Uh, these are sample traits, so sometimes they don't always biologically apply to things. But we've spent a lot of time uh, layering additional customization on this basic formula, um, mostly based on the feedback from users that have adopted this system. Uh, and, and I'm sure that everyone would love for me to go through every single setting option uh, that is in the app, but um, I'll, I'll restrain myself a little bit and highlight just a few here that, um, that kind of show the the level that we've we've taken uh, to customize this the workflows that are available. And so on the the left here we have the the option to map volume keys to our actual navigation within the app. And so instead of having to use the screen, we can just hit the volume key to go to the next plot. Uh, so we have that tactile feedback. Uh, we can adjust what our return key signal does, which is really important for barcode scanners, which is one more slide forward. Uh, and then finally, we can disable entry navigation if there's no data. And so we can really ensure that um, 
no entry is missed for the data types that are being captured. Uh, and then on the right here, we have some additional customization that has been added um, to modify what the collect screen actually looks like. So changing which toolbar icons are up at the top or the number of info bars to display more data uh, as needed from for any given breeding program. And so I've alluded to this a, a few times, um, but we've uh, really strived to include robust support for barcodes throughout the entire app. Uh, and these can be used both for data capture, like on the left for leaf length, where the, the leaf blocks the barcode uh, up until the, the length of the leaf, um, or in the middle for plant height, where we have Jesse out measuring some wheat plots with a barcoded um, centimeter stick. I don't know how long it actually was. Uh, but, um, but we can also use barcodes for navigation. Um, on the right, we have some banana plants that have each individually been barcoded, which allows us to navigate to each individual plant without any fear that we're on the, the wrong plant capturing data that doesn't actually go to that plant, which otherwise does happen um, really in, in every system. <laughs> uh, and so just to kind of really underline the adaptability of a field book to different systems, uh, this is sort of my alphabetic bingo card of breeding programs that are using field book. Uh, I, yeah, I always try and get like another crop every so often. Um, but these are people that have actually reached out to me for help with their breeding program or that have that I, I know personally that are actually using this system. And so it's really just highlights the adaptability of this tool for all of these different these different crops, whether they're clonally propagated, seed based, or uh, anything else in there. <laughs> and with that success, we've uh, we've really seen with that broad adaptability, we've really seen evidence in our, our usage stats uh, just of the adoption of this tool. So Fieldbook itself has more than 10,000 installs. The, the top countries that use Fieldbook are India, the US, Brazil, Nigeria, Uganda, and France. And while this graph does go back to 2017, Fieldbook development goes back even earlier and it has really been this iterative and community-driven process. And uh, ugh, we all have those old embarrassing photos that we'd rather not share. Um, I was obviously going through a blue phase in 2012 or something, but um, Fieldbook is really no different. We've made major progress uh, visually. Um, I think that's really obvious <laughs> just looking at these, these old screenshots. But we've also worked to integrate features into the app based on broad community feedback. And uh, we're leveraging those large numbers of Fieldbook users to globally deploy new technology for plant breeding and genetics programs. And so I want to spend the rest of the talk highlighting some of that work. Um, so in 2019, I had a, a NEFA fact project that was funded focused on integrating high precision GNSS units into Fieldbook. Um, and so these units are, are really precise. The location that they can deliver to systems is down to the centimeter level. Um, and so the thought was that we could, we could use these, we could map out the field, uh, and then we could use that live location reading to put our, uh, the breeder themselves into context, uh, uh, their location into context with the uh, other plots in the field which is valuable for annual crops, crops, but is invaluable for perennial crops. Um, thinking of, of as a, or thinking of a tree breeder who might have trees in the field for many years, uh, labels that might fall off of those trees, um, having the, the specific location tied to those individual trees and being able to go back to those and return to those repeatedly is, uh, is, was one of the big draws of this, this system. Um, and so the, the output or the outcome of this project really consisted of two equally important parts, uh, our GNSS trait, 
which can connect to the high precision geosensing units to survey each individual plot in the field. Um, and then our GeoNav algorithm, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, which interfaces with those same units to precisely identify the location of both the breeder and um, put them into context of their relative location to the, the actual plots and then identify the, the closest plot that, they, uh, that they're next to. It's a... Um, so to demonstrate how these two systems interact with the breeding programs and plots, um, my developer and I, I think this was in 2021 now at this point, time goes a little too fast. Uh, we went out to the uh, Kansas State football field parking lot, um, so a wide open area that we could have these nice demarcated uh, individual stalls and be able to um, to evaluate the system on. And so in this, in this photo, each of these little smudges is a parking stall number, which really gave us a nice location to be able to survey each individual um, parking stall itself. And so just, yeah, so taking the, we didn't do the entire parking lot because after 180 plots, we were, we were over it. But uh, we surveyed these plots, um, mapping that location onto the the uh, mapping those locations onto the map. Um, everything lined up really nicely, just with those individual points. Um, and so we we knew that we were actually getting realistic RTK level points. Um, and so thinking about how our GeoNav algorithm utilizes these points in relation to a breeder's position in the field, uh, if we have our, our breeder here in red, um, every second to every five seconds, the app will scan through uh, all of the plots that have been loaded. Um, it will identify the closest plot. And then within the field book interface, it will move the user, the breeder to that closest plot. And this is a greedy algorithm, so we can see that uh, the closest plot it identifies changes um, over time as it scans through each of these individual points, starting with one one up in the corner. Putting this into practice, uh, this is when I thought the when I decided technology was kind of magic was when I started uh, standing at the one one plot up in the corner and walking through uh, the, the blue plot that's being highlighted is what was being shown in field book. Um, I was just holding my phone and walking while letting the, the app operate itself. Um, but you can see that as I walk through, the, the currently selected plot in field book is updating with my current location. I, I fast forwarded this a, a little bit, so I'm not actually running through the parking lot, which would have probably looked pretty silly. But you can see that we can trace my location within the field as I meander through um, all of these different individual parking stalls. And then at this point, I, I thought that things weren't actually working. And so I tried breaking it too and going diagonally over these different stalls. Um, but ultimately, it worked really well. It, it surpassed my expectations by by a lot. Uh, my developer had been doing some testing in his backyard, um, and this is the my developer Cheney Courtney. Uh, so he had a bit higher of expectations. And so in addition to doing to mapping this entire parking lot, um, we also mapped one of these numbers and each individual number was mapped um, to a different point. And so just by holding the stick at a different angle, we were able to switch the plot as well. And so this these location sensing units are, are really precise. Um, and really adaptable down to even a single plant level for breeding purposes, at least. Uh, and so everything that I've talked up until this point is is available now in field book. This isn't, these aren't uh, mockups or anything else. Um, it, you can go download the app and, and actually use this, which is still kind of blows my mind being able to say that after showing so many mock-ups over the years. But um, I also wanted to highlight some of the current areas that we're working on to uh, continue to address the feedback that we've received during the, the lifespan of this project. So going back to our, um, our, our basic field book layout, uh, one of the design decisions we made in the beginning of the project was to essentially limit the user to only enter one phenotype 
for each trait for each plot. Um, and so in this case, we'd be able to enter one height measurement. Um, and I, I don't think that was a, a wrong assumption, um, but we were quickly, it was quickly requested to extend this to, to be able to enter in more height measurements per plot. Um, it's, it's amazing the number of requests that come uh, when you put an open source project out into the world. Uh, I can be happy to answer some of those questions. <laughs> I got emails this morning just about feature requests. But um, adapting this sort of system to, to take multiple measurements uh, really required us to think about how to um, reconfigure this layout. And so this is our, our first attempt at that. Um, this ability to add measurements, add phenotypes to um, each trait plot combination. And so we also have the, we can see how many phenotypes that we've collected up in the corner. We have our, uh, we've taken three. And if I click on that three, we can see all of those observations listed out. Uh, and so we can kind of think in the future of how we can extend this. Um, to support different systems, different different approaches for, for measuring either individual plants uh, or taking multiple measurements within the plot. But this is early days. Um, I'd love feedback from anyone on the call about what we're doing wrong and what we haven't accomplished with this feature specifically, um, because it's, it's been in, in our backlog for a long time and I'm, I'm really happy with how it's coming together. Uh, second, I want to talk about themes. And so um, going back to our, our basic field book layout, uh, when this was designed, we essentially designed everything statically. Um, and so all of the, the text sizes, the different elements, the colors were all defined on the element themselves, which really, again, not the worst choice, but it, it limits how much you can grow in the future. Um, and so one of the projects that we've recently done is going back through the entire app, um, addressing some of these to uh, pull out those measurements, uh, those values to, to where we can interface and interact with them much more quickly. And so, for instance, uh, we can change our text size um, now with this sort of approach. And so we can we can change the text size. It could be more visible on larger tablets or, or some of these larger phones that are out now. Um, but it's not just limited to that. We can also do things like change the color size. And so uh, branding opportunity for for any companies that are out there or uh, or people that really want uh, a pink field book is one of the requests that I got in the last training I did. Uh, we'll see, but. The motivation behind this is is uh, there's a secondary motivation behind this that we can also adapt this to high contrast. Um, we can adapt this with a high contrast uh, user interface, and this interface uh, really lets us um, tie Fieldbook into some of some really exciting tools that are coming out right now, including e-ink tablets. Um, and so this is a company that produces Android e-ink tablets. Tablets they are called Books. Uh, I have been on the hunt for e-ink tablets since probably 2014, and I've ordered many from uh, Alibaba and AliExpress, and have been disappointed every time. Um, but it's it's getting really close. And so why are we actually interested in these? This is the big question. Um, the battery life is phenomenal. Uh, the, the standby life for these just sitting on your desk. If you've had a Kindle, it's the same kind of system. Uh, it can be weeks or even months. Um, and of course, the screen visibility is our, our second big factor here that we we really love. Uh, these actually, I've, I've shown these to people outside. And the comment that I repeatedly get is, it looks better outside than it does inside under fluorescent light. And it's, uh, it's really, it's just, eye popping how, how good it looks under the sun. Of course, there are cons. Uh, the refresh rate is pretty low. Um, so there's some ghosting that can happen. Um, it's not an LCD. It's not updating all the time. And um, that that's a problem. It, it's kind of just the trade-off with the technology. Um, 
it is monochromatic. So any of the color that we, we use throughout the app basically has to be addressed, which we were working on with the, the themes project. Um, and then finally, there is no camera, um, which depending on, on how much you use imaging in your breeding program is a trade-off that might be worthwhile. Uh, I, depends on, on the individual breeding program. Uh, now, that being said, I put these slides together, uh, or put this slide together maybe a week ago, and the uh, books updated uh, <laughs> updated the product line in that week. And so this is a 10-inch uh, books tablet. It has a 16-megapixel camera. It's about $600. Um, and from what I read online, the, the battery lasts for about 24 hours, which is just absolutely incredible. And it's using time, not not standby time. Um, I haven't actually evaluated these. Uh, it's a little larger than the form factor, I think, would be ideal for using Fieldbook or other tools in the field. Um, but they also have color screens. Uh, color ink still kind of blows my mind, having owned a, a first generation Kindle way back in the day. Um, on the right here, we have a, a smaller version without the camera, but still with a color screen that's $400. And from what I saw claim, the, the battery life is a week um, of using time, not, not of standby. It's weeks or months of standby. But uh, so these are really well suited for remote locations um, or, or being out in the sun or things like that. And I'm, I'm really excited for this space to keep growing um, because of seeing the technology advance has been a lot of fun over the last few years. So finally, I wanted to, to spend a little time talking about our, our work toward trait plugins. And this is our most cutting edge work that we're, we're doing. Um, motivation for this is this paper that uh, Guillaume Lobe published a few years ago in Trends in Plant Science, um, where he looked at a, a bunch of different image processing tools, um, image analysis tools that have been published in the plant science, went through, categorized those, uh, reached out to the original developers to identify which tools were still under development. Um, sometimes he didn't get responses back, which wasn't good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the entire premise is, is that a lot of these tools are published and then nothing ever happens to them, um, which I think is a tragedy. Uh, a lot of these tools can be adapted for breeding programs uh, and for routine phenotyping. Uh, it's just the, the, the capacity and the, the connectivity isn't necessarily built in to those tools from the beginning. Uh, and so the, the model that we're trying to work toward is starting with Fieldbook, um, developing the, the interface to be able to bring in some of these external tools. And those tools can be, uh, we have a lot, they, they can be very dynamic and diverse. Um, so of course we have things like image analysis, uh, but extending that to uh, opportunities like external hardware um, or remote server calls with a lot of the, the machine learning tools that are being developed, uh, they, uh, the annotation and training is happening in uh, on a website and they don't actually let you use the model, but they will expose an API that you can send images to and receive results from. Uh, and so we can tap into some of those deeper systems, um, more powerful systems using these sort of approaches. And then finally analytics, um, just for the different data that's being collected. Uh, and so what does this actually what structurally am I describing here? Um, we're, we're kind of describing taking a shell uh, that we, we define the shell. Um, we put some, some code in that shell, uh, some specific code to interface with Fieldbook and some different layouts. Uh, and then we leave that, that middle section open for, um, for external developers to develop their tools. Um, and what kind of tools can these be? Uh, I've highlighted a few examples uh, on this page. Um, on the left is a uh, results from a paper that was scoring stripe rust in wheat using uh, a deep learning algorithm. 
Um, exciting part of this is that it was trained from mobile captured images um, and the accuracy of this algorithm was pretty high. Uh, if we wanted to use this routinely in, in breeding or for breeding lines, it's, we would have to capture the images currently, uh, take those to a computer, run them through this algorithm, uh, and then get our results. Um, taking this sort of plugin approach, we would be able to wrap that algorithm in these trait plugins, uh, install it on the same device, and be able to get our analysis and our scores in real time, which really lowers the barrier and the burden um, and the expertise needed for screening through some of these larger nurseries, these larger disease nurseries. In the middle is a portable spectrometer. Uh, this is building off some of the earlier work that I've done on a different mobile app. Um, the spectrometer has a, a 900 to 1700 nanometer range. Uh, it's showing a lot of promise for um, even phenomic selection, um, in addition to, to being able to measure, uh, measure different elements in, in plant tissue as well. And so integrating tools like this to connect into Fieldbook and share the, the data that's being generated uh, is really valuable. And, and this is just one example of the spectrometer. You know, there are digital calipers, scales, um, lots of hardware gets used in a breeding program. And a lot of that data stays unorganized, unfortunately. And then on the right is probably my, my most uh, the most exciting uh, example here. Um, this is a, a paper that was recently published out of Jessica Rakoski's group in Illinois, where they developed a, a deep learning um, approach to, uh, oh, excuse me, to score the frequency of fusarium infected wheat kernels. Um, but the, from again, from mobile captured images, uh, but these mobile captured images were actually captured using Fieldbook. Um, and so we, we're really aiming to just complete the analytical loop. Uh, for data collection and analysis and then interpretation. Um, but of course, for any of these, the, the first step is to being able to extract that biologically relevant information from an image is to efficiently capture, efficiently capture a clear and high quality image. Um, and that really leads into this project that was recently funded and I'm working with uh, Amanda, uh, Holzkamp and uh, Heather Manchang to develop robust imaging platforms for routine plant phenotyping. And what we're really aiming to do is to, um, you know, external cameras outside of your phone or your tablet have a lot of advantages. Um, we can use them to have rapid controlled phenotyping events. They can generate higher quality images than we can get with some of these, these tablets or, or phones, um, but most importantly, they can be operated independently uh, of our tablet or our phone. So we don't need to put those, put our Android device into a, a secure position and leave it there for a long, a long amount of time in order to ensure that all of our images um, are coming out with that quality that we need for some of these uh, approaches. And so our, our objectives really are to integrate the ability to capture images from these high quality external cameras within Fieldbook, um, and then optimize the file storage in Fieldbook to be able to support some of these larger images that we're going to uh, be capturing. And so we started this, um, we started some of this work late last year, uh, integrating uh, these portable USB type cameras, things like webcams and, and cameras along those lines. Um, and so this is a, the image isn't as pixelated as it looked. This is a, a, a Lego otter that my, my developer was using to, to test out uh, capturing images from a DSLR using a capture card. Um, our biggest limitation for this approach has been the, the quality of the images that we're able to capture. Um, and so we've, we've taken a, a, a bit of a detour in the last, honestly, week. Um, and we're actually going to start focusing on integrating GoPros into Fieldbook instead. Um, and really, this is the, the, the major driving reason for this is this link at the bottom. Um, this open GoPro uh, is a project that is maintained by GoPro, the company, to essentially open their API on their cameras 
for external developers to integrate their cameras into whatever they want. And as far as I can tell, they're one of the only camera manufacturers that are doing that. Um, so this is where I say that I, I really wish this presentation was in a month uh, because uh, our GoPros just showed up yesterday. And so um, my developers are like actively working on this right now. Uh, and so I'm really excited to be able to share these results um, later this year. Uh, so this is, I, I as a Matic <laughs> characterized me as the genius behind field, but like I wouldn't characterize myself the same way. But uh, this has been a project that has really brought in a, a lot of different people, um, providing a lot of different skills to uh, to push all of this technology forward. Um, we maintain an active list of contributors on the GitHub page. And so these are people that have um, provided translations or code or anything like that specifically to the project. Um, and it's a diverse and dynamic group of people, which I, I really love. Uh, being able to bring everyone together for this one project. Um, because I don't, I, I don't think any of these projects would be would be uh, tractable doing them by yourself. Uh, and so with that, I will open open the floor for questions um, and just thank everyone that's contributed to this specifically on this page. Um, my lab, Cheney, Mason, and Brian, uh, Jenna at Clemson has been a, a sounding board. Uh, shooting down a lot of my ideas that I think are good, but also boosting the ones that are good. Um, collaborators at K-State, including Mitchell Nielsen, uh, Washington State um, with Dory Main's group, uh, Cornell with Peter Selby and Michael Gore, um, who and Peter has helped um, a, a lot with the field of code and just organizing it into something that looks uh, a lot better than it did when, when he started. Um, USDA collaborators the, the, that I've highlighted already. And Keo's done a lot of work testing out the geo now for different systems as well. Um, Breeding Insight has also contributed a lot of code and they, they were very high, highlighted on that last page. Um, Jesse, of course, for, for letting me work on this project originally and then um, the diverse funding that we've received from uh, NIFA, Cotton Inc. USAID through the Innovation Lab for Crop Improvement, um, and then a, a previous NSF award to support some of this work. And with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Trevor. That was uh, really interesting, and I'm definitely interested to see what happens with the GoPros. <laughs>